you know, I, I suspect your audience is, is a broader left audience than, um, and like, I disagree with Marx, right? Um, mm. But I disagree with Marx. It's a different thing. I think Bakunin being like, yo, the state won't actually wither away. But I think Marx genuinely thought the state would wither away, right? Um, you right. know, as compared to all the other people who are like, hey, 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 the state is mine now, fuck you, you know? Um, and like, and then Marxism as a academic tradition, as like a philosophical tradition, correct me if I'm wrong, this is the best I've been able to tell. It's just a different thing than the political tradition of Marx when it comes to like, like there's like Marxism as like the like philosophical discipline. Mm. And then there's Marxism as like, these are the steps to revolution. Uh, and yeah, I don't know. Does that seem, is that right? I'm not trying to, I'm like literally not trying to talk shit. This is just like my best impression. Hey folks, welcome to the next interview from the Skeptical Leftist Podcast. Uh, So if you pay attention to the live videos on YouTube, then you've already heard this one. But for lots of folks, this will be a new interview. I talked to Margaret Killjoy. Uh, She was a great guest and we had an awesome conversation that went on from discussing what anarchism is to what it means to us and whether or not Kropotkin was right about World War I. Uh, It was a fantastic conversation and I had a lot of fun. I don't have an intro rant this time around, but I just... Things are pretty rough out there these days, so take care of yourself. And if you can, give some money to a charity or organization that is helping the people of Palestine. Uh, their Palestine, the Palestinian people are experiencing some pretty nasty stuff at the moment, and they need as much help as we can give. Uh, of course, I will always appreciate if you give me some money. But at the moment, I'm not the one in dire need. Uh, so if you, if however you like the interviews and read reviews and want me to be able to continue, then uh, you can support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist. If you choose to give the money to someone in more need than I am, uh, you can still help by giving the video a thumbs up and a rating of five stars on podcast apps and writing a review. Uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, for sure, make sure to uh, share the show with anyone you think might be interested, because it turns out that word of mouth is the main driver of podcast success. So if you have any questions or suggestions or even thoughts uh, you want to send to me directly, then you can do that at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Or you can contact me on any social media. I'm skept- at skeptical leftist or at skeptical lefty almost everywhere. And, or you can fill out the contact form on my website, which is skepticalleftist.com. Now with that, I'm just going to send you over to the interview. This was a really fun one. I hope you enjoy it. All right. Hi, and welcome to the Skeptical Leftist Podcast, the show where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm joined by Margaret Kiljoy. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah. Thanks for having me. So I guess... The best place to always start is a little bit about who is Margaret Killjoy? I am a creative professional who is an anarchist. I, most of my time at the moment is that I run a history podcast called cool people who did cool stuff, which is on cool zone media. I also run a preparedness podcast. So I, I geek out about history is one of my main things that I do with my time. I read history books all day for work. It's the best job that anyone in the history of the universe has ever had. No kidding. Um, And then my like hobby podcast that I also run is called Live Like the World is Dying. And it's an individual and community preparedness podcast because I spend a lot of my time thinking about how to try to help as many people as possible navigate the crises that are not only coming, but are here. Um, And I try to talk about how the current political world is entirely different than even five years ago, let alone 150 years ago when a lot of the ideologies that we may identify with uh, were were coming up. Right. And I think that disaster and crisis are a a major part of that. Uh, What else do I do? I write fiction. I guess that's like the main thing I do, right? That is the thing I've been doing longest is I'm a speculative fiction writer. I I don't want to just like list off my books, but I write a lot of different books. And if you like adventure and punks and anarchists and crime and queerness and heart, like people being nice to each other, um, 
That's the kind of stuff I write about. I like all those things. <laughs> Great. You might like my books. <laughs> I actually, I have a copy of uh, We Won't Be Here Tomorrow. I haven't gotten into it yet, but I oh, have. Cool. A... Awesome. That is my, my short story collection. It came out from AK Press a year ago now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that might be how long I've had it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that makes sense. Are you on the AK Friends of AK Press? Uh, I was for a list? while, but uh, we're trying to pay off our our debt so that we can eventually buy our home. So I am no that longer. That makes sense. Anyone who's listening, it's a real good deal. If you subscribe, they mail you every book that they put out, and it's yeah. an incredible deal. Um, it does create a. I have a lot of books in my house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was trying to, uh, I, I had to force myself to read, but before I uh, joined the AK Press Friends, I mm-hmm. I never, ever had time to read and I didn't have the motivation either. But then right. I started getting all these books. So I was like, okay, I got to start doing something. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah it, so it was nice. It's the nicest feeling in the moment in the in the world when you have a moment to actually just sit down and be like, I'm going to read for the next hour. I don't care. But it's it's hard to get. Um, I, yeah. I mostly listen to audiobooks and podcasts for, besides when I'm reading history books for work, right? My, my pleasure reading is mostly audiobooks. I, uh, I work in the oil industry and, uh, at, a, at a waste disposal facility. So mm-hmm. it's very dirty. <laughs> so yeah. some of my books, I've, I've taken them out into the facility with me cause I got to <laughs> sit and watch pumps. Right. But then they get covered uh-huh. in gross stuff and like. I decided I don't want to do that anymore and wreck my books. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can you can you listen to audiobooks while you watch pumps or is that not work? I can, but uh yeah, I, in fact it's actually good because then I can have earbuds in and it mm-hmm. drowns out the very loud pumps. <laughs> oh, that makes sense. But during the day there's always customers coming in bringing in more material, so I got to have take the earbuds out. Yeah, that may. Yeah. I, otherwise it'd just be a nice perfect job where you just sit calmly watching that's right loud thing. yeah <laughs> listen to podcasts and watch pumps that'd be great yeah you kind of talked about your podcast like how long have you been doing live like the world is dying i started live like the world is dying in january 2020 before covid which was a good time to get in on the ground floor of the apocalypse <laughs> um and talking about the apocalypse because i started it i remember you know it's just, it's been an interest of mine for a long time and ever since a i have a friend who's an environmental engineer who studies land use and, and greenhouse gas emissions and stuff and is part of the agriculture industry essentially from an okay um, studying it from an academic point of view and one year she called me it's probably 2015 or something and she was like hey it probably won't happen but we might have a grain shortage this year and I never really like sat there and thought about what a grain shortage would mean, right? You know, I, I have all these visions about creating a better society, but I never just like sat there and been like, well, what if we stop having all the grain that we rely on? Yeah. <laughs> it's and, pretty heinous. <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, every year since, especially the last couple of years, you know, we read about um, India has just... Uh, banned exports of a lot of their types of rice. They're one of the primary exporters of rice, but they need to be able to meet domestic demand. They're having India is being hit harder by climate change uh, by like population numbers than probably anywhere in the world, is my my current guess. Um, and so they've had to make a lot of decisions about that, and that might have impacts on the rest of the world's food supplies. And then, of course, obviously, right. the war in Ukraine isn't helping. That's unlikely to affect the United States and Canada, but it absolutely impacts the Middle East and Northeast Africa, mm. where a lot of the grain comes from. Ukraine's one of the breadbaskets of the world, right? And the the wild weather has impacted the United States uh, severely, and so that's part of the food inflation that we see. It's mostly impacting the cost of like feed animal feed right um yeah and then that cost of animal feed of course then gets carried over into the cost of animal products but you know and so so i started collecting like buckets of rice basically i didn't like have any money and i just lived in a punk house i was running with some of my friends and i was like it's time for buckets of rice and people were like all right whatever you're weird (laughs) and no one's ever thought otherwise so it didn't really bother me 
And finally, at some point, I, you know, I moved from place to place, dragging my buckets of rice with me to like the off grid barn that I lived in for <laughs> three or four years or something. And, and most of the time, even among anarchists and, and, and leftists and things, I was not always around other people who shared this perspective. And finally, mm. I was like, I need to do something to start connecting people who do share this perspective because we exist. And so I started the podcast, Live Like the World is Dying. And the idea was I was just going to interview different people who knew about stuff. This is one of the best ways. You've probably figured this out. Um, my first book was just interviews with anarchist fiction writers because I was like, well, I don't know the answer to some stuff. but I, So I'm going to ask all these people the answer to some stuff. You know, and every now and then people are like, when I give my like talk about the importance of anarchist fiction writing, I'm just paraphrasing a bunch of people who talked to me in 2008. You know? <laughs> nice. And... Yeah, no, it's 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 information that stuck with me. And so I decided to do the same about preparedness. And then like I think it's like episode two or three is about COVID. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Jeez, um, yeah. <laughs> and then, now we're in lockdown. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then like for me, lockdown was um I lived off grid in a cabin that I had built and I didn't really uh, have any money and my cabin didn't really have any amenities. And so and I kind of have a bit of a fear of you know you study these crises all the time right and you're like we didn't know how bad COVID was going to be and it was really bad it wasn't quite as bad as it could have been but yeah. we didn't know i didn't like have human contact for months i just lived in a cabin wow. and hung out with the eastern <laughs> fence lizard on my front porch and ate through my my prepper supplies and filled it uh, wow there's some word here it filled in the gaps with like wild greens and i wouldn't recommend this <laughs> <laughs> um anyway not so the, most the podcast got more popular <laughs> yeah no it was not pleasant at all i also kind of lost my mind fair what was your where were you stuck oh actually it was it was almost like a holiday mm -hmm. <laughs> in some ways like i yeah, uh makes sense i i got you know we got the in canada we had the serb so we each got two thousand dollars mm -hmm. a month during lockdown and uh mm -hmm. me and my partner and uh we had just moved in together like uh, two in January of 2020. And then I got laid okay. off uh -huh. in March of 2020. So uh -huh. then we were like, we were just together for like three months in the house. And no. like, just, yeah. Getting to know each other better and like yeah. living the life. Yeah. It was, it was actually like fantastic for our family. Like we just spent all this time together. And no, often cool. we, that... <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Often we wish we could go back to it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. See, whereas when I'm like, I miss living in my cabin and not talking to anyone, that's not a sign of positive mental health for me. <laughs> um, right. yeah. 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 No, it was, but then uh, it wasn't long into the COVID lockdown that I started having to do gig work to, you know, make ends meet. Mm -hmm. So then yeah, when everybody was, when all the right wingers were complaining about being locked in, I was like, well, what are you talking mm -hmm. about? I'm out here working every day, delivering you guys yeah. food. <laughs> so yeah. well, this is nonsense. You're all complaining over nothing. But. Yeah. It really just meant that they wanted to force workers to come yep. in and work at their shitty small businesses. Yeah. When they were complaining about not being able to go to the, go to the gym, that's when you knew it was bullshit, right? <laughs> like, yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. There's never been a lineup to my gym before, and now you all want to go all of a sudden. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, like, you know, it's like it makes sense to miss social spaces, and it makes sense to miss, yeah. you know, there's a lot of things that made sense about it, right? But, like, as soon as that started happening, I was starting to get be like, oh, this is going to go bad. This is going to go really bad. Because for the first couple of months, everyone actually believed in COVID, and that was really nice. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's right. And it was one of my favorite things. I watch a lot of like preparedness, you know, prepper YouTube and stuff like that. Right. And, and I mostly watch the centrists or the lefty people. Um, and the centrists have to avoid talking about politics, but they believe in like science. Right. And so they have a hard time <laughs> yeah. talking to a lot of the prepper audience because they're like, now I don't want to get political, but we did have a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's like, Oh my God. Imagine having to like, I'm so glad that I, um, wear my politics on my sleeve and yeah you know i don't only interview anarchists i don't only push this or that solution i mean i push push community minded solutions so in right. that sense it is a or rather i push solutions that 
deny that there is a dichotomy between the individual and the community, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I, I push solutions that uh, embrace both at the same time. Um, but I guess my politics come in pretty so glad that I, I can just fuck it myself. It limits, I'm sure it limits my audience on some level, but whatever, the right-wingers are not like short on preparedness options. Right. Yeah. It, uh, like you say, like it, it probably does limit one's audience, but it's good to be more on the, I think the side of like, yeah, the, the dichotomy between the individual and the community is false, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah we yeah. need both they yeah. they both are part of each other so the core part of my politics and why i have a hard time envisioning certain other political <laughs> positions <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah like right-wing libertarianism or authoritarian communism to me i'm just like well you got half the memo like yeah what are you doing <laughs> you got half of it yeah that's right yeah. Look, let me draw you a map. There's four quadrants. One of them is better than the other three. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I yeah, obviously, a hundred percent on board with that. <laughs> yeah, I am. So, I guess one of the things I like to ask people is like, well, uh, about their politics is like, so you're mm-hmm. you identify as an anarchist, but uh, mm-hmm. what does that mean to you? Yeah. And what it means to me is like changed and shifted over time, right? And there's like, on one level, it's as simple as like, I found that the label that most accurately describes my politics is a political ideology that, or a, a umbrella of political ideologies that can be called libertarian socialism, or it can be called anarchism. And like, largely were developed in response to the Enlightenment by socialists in the mid 19th century. Um you know, there's like that level of it, right? Like, right. I remember, I remember once I was, uh, to, to talk about anarchist fiction, Henry Miller was an anarchist, this, this postmodern writer. And I, I actually haven't read many of his books, but he was very important when I was a pretentious teenager. And, <laughs> you know, and no one, I didn't know anything about his politics. And then I found out I was an anarchist and I was, I was reading this like book length interview with him. And the interviewer was like, well, you call yourself an anarchist, but you're so organized. And he's like, <laughs> yeah, totally. Hmm. Next question, you know, and the guy's like, "No, no, no! Don't you get it? You call yourself an anarchist, but you're so organized." And he's like, "Yeah, no." And the guy's like, "Well, why do you call yourself an anarchist?" And he's like, "Because I like read Bakunin and shit, right?" <laughs> um, you know, and and what he meant was that there's a specific political ideology that has like it's not an amorphous thing; it's a it's a blurry thing, right? It's an anti ideology of an ideology, and it it eschews certain boundaries, but it right. it's still recognizable. There is a a a thing that you can point to and be like, like a ghost doesn't have solid outlines, but you can still be that's like, anarchism. That ghost, <laughs> that's... Right? Yeah. It's the one that's haunting Europe. Sorry, Marx. And, um, <laughs> and so, so there's like that part of my anarchism. There's like, well, this is the, I threw my lot in with this political ideology, but right. at the same time, I really do. One of the things I love about anarchism, I don't define myself as an anarchist. I describe myself as an anarchist uh, okay. because I don't make my decisions based on saying what would an anarchist do or what would Kropotkin do or what would Emma Goldman do? Although those are right. not bad starting points. Fine examples. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I guess my whole test would be the, if I were to pick one person. Um, but instead I say, well, I believe in a society that does not use capitalism or coercive authority or have institutions like patriarchy, white supremacy. Um, and, I believe in this sort of anti-ideology, ideological position. The label that makes sense to use is anarchism. And it provides like a lens with which to view all the things that I'm interested in. Um, But beyond that, I've never really had a ton of interest in like really nailing down my politics beyond that. We were talking ahead of time and I was saying that I'm anarchist without adjectives um, because I guess I like Malatesta. Um, And... And the reason for that is that I like, I kind of don't know. Like I'm, I'm pretty open-minded. Uh, right. To me, I'm in charge of me is like the base core of stuff. Right. And, and so mm-hmm. I'm open-minded, but I'm not open-minded to like following Stalin. And I also don't think that like telling other people what to do and creating a system that like capitalism that forces other people to do what you want them to do. Right. Like those are outside the limits of possibility, but like, 
I'm not going to cry if you just drop me into democratic confederalism. I'm not like, oh, you anti-state Marxist, I disagree with you about the following the political lineage. I'm not going to be like, Zapatismo is a problem because it didn't come from fucking France in 1840, right, right. started by a misogynist named Proudhon. Like, I, I, um, and not that those things are anarchism, right? But rather, I, I'm not interested in in holding myself to you know, people always come up with these limits about what anarchists can be. Like one of the, okay, as an example, um, if you like read what anarchists do historically and like the things that define us, like some of the main things that you get is like, they don't work with political parties, but instead use direct mm. or direct action to try and create a, um, a, you know, an anarchistic or a socialistic system, right? Or right. communist space. Um, and they uh, are against religion. This is a thing that gets brought up for as an example of like one of the core things of, of anarchists that are all throughout the 19th century. And it's not true. Um, it's just not actually true that anarchists are historically against religion. A lot of individual anarchists are against religion. Sure. But even... Among the like, I was reading this diary of this. Po- I'm going to use weird history anecdotes as I ramble, because um, this is the way that my brain works. There's this diary of this Polish soldier. I met his son in British Columbia, where he was selling his father's book, and he okay. didn't like us. He didn't like me and my friends because we were punks, and he assumed we were leftists, and he assumed we were Bolsheviks. And I didn't. And I go up to this farmers market at a on an island in British Columbia, and I'm like what's this book? And he's like, what do you know about World War II? And I'm like, great, let's talk about Finland and World War II, man. It wasn't that messy. And he's like, yes, you and your friends, you're not Bolsheviks, are you? And I'm like, oh no, we're anarchists. And he gets really excited. And he opens up his father's memoir. That is the thing he's selling at this farmer's market. I can't imagine he's sold many copies. Uh, the rest of the community is like, yeah, there's 30 people who live on this island. We've all <laughs> um, right. and, and he opens up to this page and it's his father who uh, survived the Soviet massacre of um, of the Polish uh, the Polish military who would have been fighting Nazis otherwise. Thanks, Stalin and the Molotov Ribbentrop <laughs> Pact. Um, and he gets sent to Siberia. He's like the only survivor of the Caton Forest massacre, and okay. or one of the only ones. I don't know. And he gets sent to Siberia, and his life is saved by an anarchist. And he describes the anarchist as a Christian anarchist who follows Tolstoy and Kropotkin. And okay. the reason that this matters is because sometimes people talk about the Tolstoyan anarchists as a separate thing than the rest of anarchism, right? Because mm. since they're Christian anarchists, they're not really anarchists, right? Uh. But there's this guy, his main thing is that he's an anarchist and this has gotten him sent to Siberia and he is now working on keeping people alive in Siberia through direct action and, and caring, Right. But he also is a follower of Kropotkin is the way that he is described from this, by this Polish soldier. Okay. Um, and I just run across this all the time. This is like a, a, a weird, small, random example, but one of my favorite stories. Also, the way that they help the guy survive is literally it was so cold outside that the morgue was warmer. Um, oh, geez. And so literally, he, when the guy was like freezing to death, he would bring him into the morgue. The anarchist ran the morgue um, at the death camp. Um, sorry, work camp. And would hide him among the bodies. And he would like do this. He would just like rotate people through, like hiding among the bodies. Warm up. Stay warm. In, yeah, geez. Yeah. Um, I posted hmm. about this once on Twitter, and a bunch of uh, tankies were like, that guy deserved it. <laughs> you don't know this guy. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> um, yeah. So the point of that, to, to tie it back together, is that um, that's just an example, right? That, right. Um, you know, anarchists have existed outside of the bounds of anarchism, but still been within the anarchist movement for a very long time. Um, and I, I love that blurriness. I love the uneven edges. That's awesome. I, uh, cool. I, I, I got, uh, like I'm, I'm an atheist, but I don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I used to be one of those atheists that constantly yeah. argued about religion and how bad it was. And yeah eventually like my anarchism like because i also identified as an anarchist but mm-hmm. i was an atheist was my identity yeah, yeah. and yeah. uh ah, i see uh-huh totally you know <laughs> but now like as i grew more into my anarchism i'm more of a like um like i'm more in tune inclined to be of the uh 
okay, believe whatever you want kind of thing. And like, right. if you happen to believe in Christianity, sure. But none of us get to impose any ideology or yeah. any belief on each other. And that's yeah, kind of totally. what that is. No, I, I, I completely agree with that. And I think that anarchism and atheism have done an incredible amount of work attacking the institutions of these religions that are incredibly right. oppressive. Yeah, um, the power is the problem, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, you know, there are people who identify with like cultural and religious frameworks outside of that are specific religious frameworks, but are also opposed to those institutions, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, all right, y'all are cool, cool with me. I don't know what I believe. I'm like on this weird kick right now where I'm like really interested in all this stuff. Um, I'm somewhere in a triangle between an atheist, a pagan, and a Catholic. I don't know where the fuck I'm going to land. <laughs> um, but, you know. I, um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah no, that's exactly it. I guess it's like similar to like how I feel about like... um. Okay, well, like, what, what, what style of anarchist are you, right? I outed myself as an anarchist without adjectives. Are <laughs> I you, call myself an, an anarcho-communist. Yeah, cool. So, um, A Kropotkinite. Yeah, but I, <laughs> I discovered relatively early after I started calling myself that, that communists uh -huh. do not think uh -huh. I'm a communist. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, they, don't, they don't like, uh, uh, I, can't, I can't answer questions in the Communism 101 subreddit because I'm an anarchist. <laughs> <laughs> that's so. that's awful because <laughs> theoretically communism is the goal of all socialism <laughs> like, supposedly yeah <laughs> uh yeah it's, uh, it's funny i actually did get banned from a couple subreddits that were communist because i was like well but anarchism is the right thing come on <laughs> yeah and they were like, sorry, in 1872, we kicked you out of the international. We got to kick That's you out. That's right. Of we cannot accept you now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. Very strange stuff. But yeah, I, 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 I like Kropotkin. I, I guess I've had, yeah. you know, I've read lots of other stuff too that I'm kind of like, well, maybe not everything he said was great. <laughs> yeah. But in general, What's I like your take Kropotkin. on his World War I take. Obviously, he was wrong about World War I. <laughs> I think you're probably right. But, what makes it different from what this is a genuine question of curiosity. What makes it different from like, I support the Ukrainian fighters against the Russian invasion. Right. Right. Um, what is the distinction? A lot of anarchists went and fought in world war one at the beginning of it. Like you have um, Maria Nikiforova, um, the, the woman who started the black guards, the like anarchist military formations during the Russian okay. civil war. Um, and was like a big part of the Ukrainian uprising. And, uh, she once robbed Makhno at gunpoint because he wouldn't continue to support her. <laughs> and she was like, don't trust the Bolsheviks. They're going to betray us. And he, she was right. Um, yeah. But she's <laughs> fucking cool. Uh, but yeah. she fought in World War I for France because at the time, a lot of anarchists, like people were like, oh, Kropotkin is one of a minority of anarchists who did this. That's like the like big talking heads, right? The big talking heads. Mm. But then the like actual rank and file of anarchism, um, which should be the... A lot of them went and fought in World War One, And I'm not, yeah. I assume that all of my friends who are like anti-Kropotkin's take on World War One, I, I assume they're right. But I wonder just I mean, cause most of the time when I haven't really looked into something, my friends are usually right about it. I'm careful about who I pick <laughs> as my friends. Um, but just literally ask the question, what is the difference between that and like I support the anarchist units fighting in Ukraine? And I also just support the people of Ukraine fighting um, against the invasion, even though yeah. it involves working for the Ukrainian government. Yeah, I think I think there. I think like they say, like there's nuance to be had there, mm -hmm. right? Like because I support the anarchists in Russia and I support the anarchists in Ukraine, and right. and, um, and they have consensus about what to do, which is fight <laughs> against Russia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I, obviously, in this case, Russia is like the imperial force trying to do the thing. So. I guess support the people. <laughs> That's always the, the thing. And I guess when it totally. comes to Kropotkin, I guess maybe mm -hmm. maybe I didn't know his position as well as I think I do. Uh, but, I don't know uh, it very well. I so only know. I got the impression that he was not he was not nuanced enough in his di mm -hmm. distinction between the, the states, the state, and the people. I guess. Yeah. But again, I could be mistaken. Yeah. So I'm I'm open to uh, 
correction on that for sure. No, no, I, I don't have corrections. I don't know a ton of this is like at the edge of what I'm just starting to learn about. And I'm like yeah. kind of interested. And in I keep finding all of the things that go around it, you know, ah. um, and I haven't like dove into it yet. Um, yeah, no, I, I don't know. Yeah, I find um, like I, I feel like that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I, every book I read, I'm like, okay, but that I need more now. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that makes sense. So. With the, I mean, the name of your podcast, Skeptical Leftist, like that is what skepticism is really cool from my point of view is the like taking everything that we should take for granted. And absolutely, people have religious understandings of anarchism. Absolutely, people have dogmatic understandings of anarchism. And they should always be interrogated. Um, for sure. For sure. So. And then, I mean, again, it w- I, I probably I don't have a position on the World War One thing. I'm just like I because I haven't looked into it yet. Yeah, I was uh, I I as far as like dogmatically uh, having like a view of anarchism, I've I've been there. Like, and I in some ways yeah. I still am, right? Uh, yeah. But like, like I was the guy on Twitter who's like defining anarchism and going, "No, this is what it is," and and instead, yeah. I'm much more, I guess nuanced now i'm much more open to other people interpreting it differently so yeah no it makes sense and th- we can still recognize that the shit that, that that's outside the bounds of it and sometimes in yes. fine ways like when murray bookchin was like i don't think i'm an anarchist actually i think i'm a whatever he called himself a social ecologist municip- <laughs> oh, that, yeah they came later yeah yeah i don't know um you know and i've read some book bookchin and i'm kind of like yeah no you're right you're not an anarchist, like, but not in like a fuck you way. Just in a, like, I see why it is useful from as defining taxonomies to, to have you outside of that, you know? Um, yeah, that's right. Because so there's like mm-hmm. categorization okay. is a thing, right? So then if yeah, you don't fit useful. in the box, then you don't fit in the box. So be it. <laughs> yeah. And just like, we just need to make sure that like, we're not like trying to murder everyone who doesn't fit into our box, <laughs> yes. you know? Um, yeah. I think about yeah. all the time. Sorry, I'm just thinking about history all the time because that's just what I do for work. Uh, you know, um, the fuck my brain turned off. Okay, so Franco when he invaded Spain, right in 1936, right. and staged a coup, and and you know, won and killed all the anarchists and all that shit, right? Um, the ones that for, Stalin didn't successfully kill first. Uh, he has this quote where he's like, "I'm willing to kill half of Spain to rule the other half," and to me. This is the perfect example of fascism, right? Right. Um, but we have to think about that. All revolutionaries have to think about that and have to think about what are we doing to make sure we are not saying the same thing. Yeah. Um, if your politics involve killing all of your political enemies rather than stopping all of your political enemies, you are encroaching into authoritarian yeah. uh, territory, you know? Yeah. And so like, there's people that I like need to stop by any means, like Nazis, like Franco, like, you know, right. um, and then there's other people where we need to disagree and we need to stop them from stopping us. Yeah. You know, um, I don't know. That's just something that's been on my mind. Yeah. It, it makes me think of uh, a conversation. Like I recently, uh, okay. So at my job, I mm-hmm. truck drivers come in all the time. And sometimes you see the same guy over and over again. Mm-hmm. And so uh, about a few months ago, there was a guy, he started coming in, he was training on a truck and you start to get to know the guy and you go, well, I don't know if I like this guy. He's got some pretty backwards ideas and he's kind of holding mm-hmm. on to some conspiracy stuff that I don't really like, but then you get to know him more and, and, and like, well, he's got, he's got good intentions. He's got, he's got a well-meaning, you know, kind of mentality about the world. He doesn't want to hurt anybody. He just wants, you know to make things better, but he's just, you know, got different ideas about things. So yeah. you decide, well, I like him, even if I disagree with him, <laughs> Yeah, but, but he's not a fascist. So of course there's right. <laughs> so totally. I'm not going to murder him. <laughs> like, yeah. Not that I'm going to murder anybody. But. <laughs> right. Right. But like, yeah. you know, yeah, the fascism needs to be stopped in a way that like, I actually often try to think about like, I don't think anyone's killed more communists than authoritarian communism by just like, right. I, I, I just don't actually think it's true. I think Stalin and some of the other authoritarian communists probably have the highest death count of communists, you know, um, yeah. and not just sent to their deaths, but like literally killed at the hands of, and 
yeah, fascism's up there too, right? You know, like um, of course the, the World yeah. War Two had a lot of communists <laughs> also. Yep. But um, I try to think about like, like I am politically and morally opposed to authoritarian communism, um, right? And I, I don't make any. I'm not shy about that. And you know, a lot of people uh, who are like sort of fence sitters like about it sometimes get upset at me. Actually, it's mostly the people who are like diehard Marxist Leninists who get really mad at me. Um, I got really mad. When I found out that Marxist Leninism means Stalinism, um, I assumed it meant Lenin. Just like foolishly, I thought Marxist Leninism <laughs> was like Marx and Lenin. Right. You know? Yeah. As soon as I found out by arguing with Yankees on Twitter and Reddit and shit that like Marxist Leninism is, is just Stalinism. It's just apologism like, the, for the worst fucking thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then I'm just like, man, I wanted to have nuanced conversations about how like the Bolsheviks were messed up at the beginning but had their hearts mostly in the right place and, and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, but I can't even get to that because people are still literally apologizing for fucking Stalin. Right. And then they do it by disguising what they're talking about by talking about Marxist Leninism anyway. Um, but when I talk to someone who is like Marxist Leninist or, or, or something like that, there's still a complete, I am like militantly opposed to tankyism as an ideology, but like there's still a difference versus fascism. And mm-hmm. and I think it's the intentions, um, because the Nazi intention is I want a pure ethno state, fuck everyone, and the communist intention is the same as my communist intention, which is to create a society where, you know, the rich don't own everything, and we collectively make our own lives and all power to the Soviets. And you know, um, I'm sure anyone listening to this podcast knows that Soviet means commune, not the Soviet states, um, and. You know, it's like the, like like from each according to ability to each according to need. There's like so much we agree on, right? Yeah. Um, but our our difference about um, tactics, strategy, and more importantly, ethics is, is, is sometimes an insurmountable difference. But I, I still try to hold on to it because I, I think about it where I'm like, why do I I want to? I'll have conversations with Marxist Leninists. Uh, like honestly, at this point, I mostly avoid them to be frank. But like. But someone who's like leaning in that direction, someone who's like coming out of that space, right? Um, the fascism is just poison. It's just, yeah, you know, um, yeah. I don't want to dehumanize people. And I like recognize that like literally everything and everyone is complicated. Um, but there's still just like, yeah, you get into like the fix your heart or die territory when you talk about them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I hear you. Actually, uh, my uh, my co-host for the other s- segment I do on this show is uh, mm-hmm. uh, he uh, he's an ex Marxist Leninist who now yeah. is like a, a just a Marxist humanist I guess he he identifies okay. as now yeah which is but the the difference being of course that once they started making the apologies for Stalin he's like well hold on now <laughs> yeah <laughs> I thought we were talking about Lenin why are we why are we apologizing yeah. for Stalin <laughs> yeah. Because the person who coined the phrase Marxist-Leninism was fucking Stalin. Um, right. Unless I'm wrong about this, but I heard that from Marxist-Leninists. I, like, I don't think I'm slandering when I, when I say that, you know? Um, no, I It can, was like a I way to dis- it define sure. it compared to Trotsky, I think. I think it was like... Right. I don't know as much about... And he didn't want to call it history. Stalinism. <laughs> right. Totally. <laughs> For so. some weird reason, didn't want to be honest about that part. Yeah. Yeah. Um, fucking killed everyone who worked for him um whenever i'm watching movies and like the bad guy like randomly shoots one of his underlings because the underling failed i'm always like that's so unrealistic and then i read about (laughs) stalin and i'm like no no no." so there's people who did that yeah yeah totally got away with it too um (laughs) yeah (laughs) i don't know why i'm on this tangent (laughs) (laughs) you go where you go where the brain takes you sometimes yeah but i guess i I do want to say is like you know, I, I suspect your audience is, is a broader left audience than, um, and like, I disagree with Marx, right? Um, mm. But I disagree with Marx. It's a different thing. I think Bakunin being like, yo, the state won't actually wither away. But I think Marx genuinely thought the state would wither away, right? Um, you know, right. as compared to all the other people who are like, hey, 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 the state is mine now. Fuck you, you know? Um, and like, and then Marxism as a, academic tradition as like a philosophical tradition correct me if i'm wrong this is the best i've been able to tell it's just a different thing than the political tradition of marx when it comes to like like there's like marxism as like the like philosophical discipline 
Mm. And then there's Marxism as like, these are the steps to revolution. Uh, and yeah, I don't know. Does that seem, is that right? I'm not trying to, I'm like literally not trying to talk shit. This is just like my best impression. Yeah, no, I think there is a distinction there. And then, uh, I think often you'll find that, uh, the people who are like, they think that Marx veered away from his initial kind of uh, like they, they often think of two Marx, right? The early mm -hmm. Marx and then the, the later Marx. And one of them is the revolutionary Marx and the other one is the humanist Marx or whatever, who oh, was more, who was more amenable. Uh, so yeah, the it, later it's Marx complicated. Is the humanitarian Marx. Yeah. More humanitarian uh, Marx. Okay. But, uh, yeah. Many people who identify as Marxist humanists, they think of them as the mm -hmm. same thing. So then. <laughs> right. Well, they need a third in there and then they get a trinity. Oh, that's angles. right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Angles. Um, oh. We actually have a comment on YouTube. Oh, um, I forgot that people are watching this live. Yeah, not a lot, but some. <laughs> uh, um, so, yeah, in my experience, tankies are so dogmatic that they can excuse genocide. They'll tell yeah. you if you are opposed to. You are up, you are eating U.S. propaganda. Uh, yeah, I kind of lost count of the number of times I got called a Western chauvinist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, I don't like the U.S. or Canada either. <laughs> I know. What's so hard about two things can be bad? That seems so yeah. easy to me. There's lots of things where both sides are wrong. Yep. Like most things, both sides are wrong. I don't know. Like <laughs> I even thought. I don't know. This is too nerdy, or I'm wrong about it. <laughs> I thought Mar I thought dialectics was going to be cooler. I was an anarchist <laughs> for like 20 years before I actually started tackling dialectics, and I thought it was going to be like. I guess I had like more heard about Hegelian dialectics, maybe, but I was like, okay. I thought it was about taking things that seem like they're opposed and creating a synthesis that is the combination that that, that is a a unique, beautiful third thing, like that meme, the like, what about the secret third thing, right between the the idea and the counter idea, right? Um, like, like for example, uh, you know, there's like patriarchal monogamy, right? Hetero, heteronormative monogamy. And, and people were like, whoa, that's fucked up. So they were like, fuck yeah, we're going to do polyamory. But then they, there's a version of polyamory that has like no emotional responsibility and does not create state stability in people's lives, right? And okay. some people want that. But then other people are like, well, I want the secret third thing. That's like probably still polyamorous. And this is actually what polyamory probably actually is, right? But like, um, but they want the secret third thing where they still have emotional responsibility. Like instead of just being the counter, they're right. now that they have been the counter, they're looking to see what synthesis they can create. Um, I thought that was the dialectical thing. And then I found out it was more like when there's a bad thing and you fight it, you create the good thing. And I'm like, that's like not as interesting <laughs> to me. Um and I think it 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 leads itself maybe, and it, I I think actually people probably do amazing things with dialectical thinking and, and Marxist dialectics. I don't. I just haven't been exposed to it in a way that is useful to me. Um, I like. Oh, I don't know where I'm going with this. I, I I just I think that it more than one thing can be bad, and so it's like sometimes mm -hmm. the synthesis. Oh, that was bad. The thing you came up with to solve it is also bad. Like, what else can we come up with? Let's do a it? different thing. Yeah. 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 But that also might be the scientific method where like Marx, now I'm going way more into shit talk than I expected to. Uh, you know, Marx is like, oh, this is like a scientific thing, right? And and to be clear and to be fair, like science meant something different at the time where he first started calling it science, right? right? Um, but like, but overall, like if science is like you come up with a hypothesis and you test the hypothesis and then you reanalyze your position based on that, um, the hypothesis, the state will wither away was, was proven untrue uh, right. in repeated experiments. Yep. Um, That's right. So... And that doesn't mean anarchism is correct from a scientific point of view. Our hypothesis is largely untested. I mean, you know, we have Ukraine, we have uh, Spain, and we have uh, the Korean experiment in Manchuria. But, like, none of those lasted more than, like, three years, right? Like, the closest yeah. we probably have are Zapatismo and democratic confederalism, which aren't anarchism. They're just anti-state, right. anti-capitalist situations. Right. Like, but I'll take the untested hypothesis instead of the tested <laughs> one that failed. Yeah, that's right. Like, so uh, if you're talking about, like... Uh falsifiability the state withering way has been falsified this is not yeah. a thing that happens you cannot apply that anymore you have to have a yeah. new theory and yeah. and i mean sure maybe i don't know i guess i always get defensive when uh when mm. non-anarchists talk about 
oh, well, anarchism has never been tried. I'm like, well, sometimes it, has. it, it sort works. of has. Yeah. <laughs> we just don't like, know whether or not, like, because the anarchists yeah. in Spain ran prisons, right? Right. Um, so they had perfect. really, there was still kind of a transitional thing. They were trying to go real direct and they were way more direct. Mm. But we haven't proven long-term stability at the scale of millions of people. Right. The thing we have proven time and time again is that it is a um, a, a good way to live a beautiful and meaningful life. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is a good way to stay ideologically consistent and ethical. Um, I know a lot of anarchists don't like the word ethics, but I don't care. Um, you know, and so there's like I'm all a big these... ethics guy myself. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> um, yeah, because I mean, honestly, that's where it comes down to for me. It's not even a strategic question. I'm just like, well, yeah. you kind of can't genocide people, and you kind of can't <laughs> yeah, that's right. kill half of Spain to rule the other half of Spain. And like the thing I like about anarchism is you can't hold a gun to someone's head and say you are an anarchist now. You can hold a gun to someone's head and say you are a communist now. And mm. um, and so I think anarchism is a better system, like literally just based on that. Uh, yeah. Which means it's like messier, right? Um, and I don't know, but I also think it's telling that the fucking Ukrainian anarchists didn't ban the Bolshevik paper because they were like believed in pluralism, you know. Right. And even like the Kronstadt right. rebellion wasn't their list of demands wasn't we demand anarchism. Their list of demands was we demand a return to the pluralistic revolution that this began as, in which the different socialist tendencies are respected. Did and one is not elevated above the other, and we figure out the future together collectively. Um, and for that, yep, Trotsky killed them, <laughs> right? Of course, because that's yeah. what you do to people who who want everybody to be on the same team in some yeah. ways. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I get, I guess, part of part of why uh, I always talk about like. Because I'm a skeptical leftist, so I came out mm-hmm. of the skeptical movement, and so I, part of me was always like saying, like that the reason I believe in anarchism is because the evidence shows that these other systems that exist or have existed yeah. are not producing the society that I think is the most ethical society. Yeah. So I'm using a combination of I think ethics and evidence based thinking to come <laughs> to come up with like a. No, anarchism work it will be better but yeah no and like honestly it's just like anytime you get a, get a large group of people together from different organizations like there's a reason that anarchists didn't occupy wasn't an anarchist movement but anarchists were the glue you right know? and the anti-globalization movement was a very similar thing and i those are the only two i can speak to out of direct experience um but like overall if like the way that the nations of the world interact with each other is as equals, uh, kind of, right? They also kill each other and do all kinds of other stuff. But like theoretically, even the United yeah. States can't be like, you, their tiny country, we are more important because we have more economy. Like theoretically, everyone's like an equal, you know, in some. Context. Like at the UN, it's a, I, I, John Rawls, I think it was, wrote in his mm-hmm. one book about uh, how the UN is an anarchist type of or, yeah. organization. Because all states yeah. are supposed to be equal on equal terms. Right. And so when you talk about a politically pluralistic movement, anarchists are often the center of it, um, not the people who are the most people, although sometimes that is true and that's like a race from history constantly. Um, mm. That of the like three, I'm like running ideas past you because I think you know a lot about this stuff and I just like kind of live in my own head <laughs> and read books all the time. Um, but like when I look at the 19th century, the socialist movement had like three rough sides. You had the social democrats, you had the libertarian communists, and you had the uh, the anarchists, the libertarian socialists. You know, um, yep. And in different countries, different groups were bigger. Like it would be a lie to claim the anarchists were the most powerful group in in Russia, right? They weren't. Right. Right. You know? um, Clearly, they were the most powerful group in parts of Ukraine at that time. Like, and then obviously, like um, here and there, but like. 1860s Mexico, the socialists were anarchists, you know, um, like various times throughout history, various places, uh, in many places of the revolutionary socialists, the democratic socialists are now outside of it when I'm drawing my triangle. Um, before 1917, anarchism and libertarian socialism was like more likely to be the norm in more countries. Mm. Um, and then that started to change into the 20th century. And especially when the Bolsheviks came to power, because people were like, well, let's give us a fucking shot, you know, because right, right. 
know what was happening yet. Um, well, and, and or and, they were like attracted power, you know? Yeah. Like, I don't, I'm like, I don't know the details entirely of it, but I know mm-hmm. like later on, like uh, Lenin and Stalin and uh, they had a project of expanding their version of communism in other places. Right. Like they, they, yeah. there were, there were communist organizations in Canada and the United States and Cuba yeah. and all over that were connected to the Bolsheviks in, in, a, in a sense. Right. And this is where you get kicked out of Reddit for the communist group, because <laughs> at this point, this is when communist means, uh, means Bolshevik. Uh, right. Right. Because of the, the common turn, the communist international, um, I, I think that's what it's short for. Uh, that is when, and so then it's awful because like, you talk about the Red Scare and all this stuff, and people are like, oh, they're all beholden to Russia. And you're like, no, they're not just fucking lefties. And you're like, <laughs> oh, no, yeah, actually. Some of them really were. Fuck the Red Scare. <laughs> like, fuck it to yeah. hell. But, like, but overall, a Communist Party meant literally yeah. under control of, uh, of the USSR. Um, yeah, getting, getting like actual, like having connections and, and, and uh, members traveling and, and funding from the actual yeah. USSR. Yeah, and and more important, and especially um, yeah, direction, you know, yeah, and yeah. and then when people like did stuff anyways, when things get really beautiful, you get like the Battle of Cable Street when uh, Mosley was defeated in in London, you know, the fascist, the brown shirt movement in in, in London. Uh, it was largely a bunch of Jewish radical labor groups that defeated him, but like the Communist Party was a part of that fight and that organizing, they were actually opposed to that organizing until the very last minute. And a ton of the people from the communist party who had been like lifelong communists after that quit and became council communists or libertarian socialists or anarchists or something else, you know, council communism brought in a lot of folks. Uh, I don't know as much about council communism. I, I, I see it on the like democratic communist side of things. And it's more interesting to me, way, way cooler than, um, wow, I haven't gotten to like just fucking nerd out about this kind of <laughs> shit. This you know, I'm glad actually I'm that it. I'm glad it took us two years to actually get this interview going because yeah. I've read so much more than I had at the time. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> same. Yeah. <laughs> so I so I can actually have this conversation. <laughs> yeah. But now I read history books all day, so I'm that asshole. Yeah, um, that's good. Yeah. Well, we're at like 52 minutes, so uh, mm-hmm. I guess. Is there any particular thing that we should cover before we hit the hour mark? Oh, man, but we've covered so many things. There's a small chance that my computer will die. And if so, farewell, everyone, um, because I forgot to plug my computer in. But since it's live, I'm not going to go up and get my charging cable. I'm just going to run this Fair. down to the wire. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I I will say, OK, at the top of it all, I said that um, things are very different now politically. And I mean that because the world's on fire. Uh, right. A lot of really bad things have happened in our history. Like World War II was actually more apocalyptic than our present moment. Um, but it's a different apocalyptic moment. And we right. are entering an apocalyptic moment. Uh, and we are entering a moment where I just use every platform I can to say we need to uh, be prepared to step in to offer not solutions, but methods by which to find solutions during times of crisis in a power mm. vacuum. The first person who shows up and says, I have an idea you that's a halfway decent idea is going to kind of win. And we don't come in and say, my idea is libertarian socialism. We come in and say, our idea is processes by which we can find out what we collectively agree on and what we want to do. Um, because yeah. the goal of it is empowering people. The goal of it is creating, um, some anarchists hate the word democracy. I'm pretty neutral on it. Uh, creating a essentially a democratic form, a form in which people collectively make decisions. Um, And I think that we are in a good position to do that because we are used to direct action. We are used to organizing um, and not necessarily like being an organizer, but like literally just like not waiting around for other people to do things. Um, Another YouTube comment. Oh, great. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, Kerrigan asks, have you read Libertarian Socialism, Politics in Black and Red? I have not. Uh, I haven't actually heard of it. I 
I'm going into history now. I haven't actually moved into theory yet. <laughs> um, but liber- uh, there's lots of uh, uh, history in uh, the because it's kind of like a discussion mm-hmm. of like Marxists and anarchists and kind of like the back and forth. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, it's very cool. Yeah, you, you no, probably I, know a lot of the history that is in it, but <laughs> it's. Yeah, but it's like I know I I I'm like picking up on what they were actually arguing about. I know more about the actual arguments, you know. Um, like I'm like, oh, this is the guy who joined and became an anarchist because the anarchists were the ones who actually put women into the international and <laughs> right. fought for wages for, uh, you know, reproductive labor, which is the dumbest term of jargon in, that has ever existed. Because reproductive <laughs> labor sounds like you're talking about making babies, but you're not. You're talking about reproducing society, but not in the baby way because it was made up, I think, <laughs> because it was anyway, whatever. Yeah. Anyway. Um, yep. But no, I haven't read that book. Um, I... I'm really excited to uh, learn more about this stuff. Like I said, I, I, you know, and I got all my theory through, I was like a little asshole who was like, I don't care about theory. All that matters is action, you know? Um, And now I'm like, oh, people were right a whole time when they said both matter. (laughs) I don't mind theory, actually. It turns out it's weird. Yeah. And, uh, okay, so... Mm-hmm. One more comment here. Organizing is so hard when you don't have structure specifically to stop power grabs. That's true. And that's why structure rules and organization rules. Yeah. Uh, I think that's one of the main misunderstandings that I'm not saying that the, this commenter has it. Um, but one of the main misunderstandings of anarchism is believing that it is like um, a lack of organization rather than instead of it being a, a system of organic organization. Um, and I absolutely agree. I think that one of the main things I pick up from reading history is that I have become far more sympathetic to anarcho-syndicalism and I've become mm-hmm. far more sympathetic to uh, federations. And um, I'm, I haven't gone so far as platformism because I think that um, it doesn't play to our strengths. I think our strengths uh, is diversity of theory um, rather than unity of theory. But um, fair. I, I agree with that commenter. We need more. Okay, energy. well... We are at 57 minutes, so okay. where can people find you? <laughs> Great. Uh, at the moment, okay, I've got a link tree. It's probably link tree, Margaret Kiljoy or something. But I started a sub stack where I write essays about preparedness and history. And um, I also have, and those are all free. And then I also have a, a paid one that's like more like memoirs and journal and that kind of stuff. Um and that is a main way, one of the main ways you can find me. I'm also every Monday and Wednesday, cool people who did cool stuff every Friday. I'm not always the host of Live Like the World is Dying, but I'm sometimes the host of Live Like the World is Dying every Friday. Um, okay. And is, uh, oh, go ahead. I oh, apologize. Go ahead. Is there is there a host that sounds similar to you on, on uh, Oh my like God, people voice. probably think I had <laughs> through. Oh, I don't okay. Know. Okay, so there's two other hosts. One is uh, a cis woman named Brooke, and one is a, a non-binary person named Inman. And Inman could totally sound like me. I hadn't even thought that through. <laughs> I, I, I was know. listening also, one day, mm-hmm. and I, yeah. I could not tell if it was you or not. Wow. But sometimes the nuance is like the sound okay. of your... Because I've listened to a lot of your voice, unfor- yeah. uh, not, not unfortunately, but like yeah, not to yeah. be weird about it. But... <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I talk... <laughs> You people can listen to me so much. It's yeah, <laughs> but I I was option. unsure if it was you or not, and I thought, well, perhaps I don't. Know. Oh yeah, I don't know. Um, wow, I hadn't on, even, a, on a very recent episode, I think it was just like yeah. Okay, if it's very I'll recent, it was very likely in men. Um, this year I've been uh, I've moved back to doing about half the episodes. Okay, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> just, just random weird thing. I was like. Hey, no, were no. you actually on that episode? It was like one about uh, uh, drug uh, creating your own drugs and or and shipping them, or maybe it was medical supplies through three D printing. Or that something was not like that. me. Yeah, okay. that was in men. Um, yeah, it was like three D printing tourniquets or something. Um, yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. No, that was that was. Uh, oh, that all makes so much sense. I'm going to tell Inman this, and they will be very <laughs> amused. Um, but. But yeah, that's where you find me. My most recent book is called Escape from Incel Island. It is an adventure story about people who need to get off of an island that's full of incels. It's a fairly literal title. <laughs> nice. Um, it is a, but it also turns into reflections on misogyny and also how carceral systems don't solve problems. Cool. Um, yeah. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for joining me. And thank you to everybody who was uh, watching in the live 
uh, version and commented on YouTube and Twitch. And uh, yeah. Yeah. We'll see you all later. Farewell. All right. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching and or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and it helps me keep the internet and the power on. Thanks to my top patrons, Some Random Geek, Damien Marie at Hope, Justin Clark, Christopher Taylor, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can send a one-time donation at to me at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a like on YouTube or a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes for links to all my stuff or check out my website, skepticalleftist.com. That's where you can find all of my social media spaces and communities. Uh, Or you can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening or watching. Make sure to leave a comment on the video or on my website. Join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda.